with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV. On radio and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up, violent shoplifters finally get what they deserve as the government U-turns to make assaulting a shop worker a criminal offence that could land you in jail. The EU approves a major pact to tighten the rules on migration requiring nations to share responsibility for asylum seekers and boost the return of irregular migrants to their home countries. And if you're shopping at M&S, this isn't just milk, it's fart-free, net-zero, e-cow milk as M&S targets the diets behind their dairy. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, only on Talk TV. We've got a jam-packed hour-long show for you tonight, so let's get straight to it. London Mayor Sadiq Khan has gone back on a promise he made in September. Who'd have thought it? After almost a decade of faffing about, the EU has finally agreed to do something about the migration crisis. I'll be discussing this later in the show with an immigration lawyer and a former MEP. And its capital is famed as a city of love, but apparently infidelity doesn't exist in France anymore. I'll explain why later in the programme. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Strap in, we're in for a bumpy ride. Now, it's a slightly different show tonight, so we're going to kick off with my suggestion about the war on the motorists, because the war on the motorists in this country continues unabated as we hurtle towards a general election. There seems to be no light at the end of the dark tunnel we're being forced to drive through. Today, it has emerged that soon it could get even worse. Despite hundreds of millions of pounds being raised by congestion charging and low emission zones around the country, despite billions of pounds being paid in parking fees and fines, the anti-car brigade have yet another more sinister plan up their sleeves. You heard it here first. The Mayor of London spent £3 million of taxpayers' money planning a pay-per-mile road charging system, despite repeatedly denying that he had any plans to introduce such a scheme. In 2022, Sadiq Khan said he was pushing Transport for London to start planning for a pay-per-mile road charging system, only to make a U-turn on it a year later after a backlash from consumer groups. And as recently as September last year, the mayor was forced to deny he was going to bring the system in. But thanks to a freedom of information request from the Daily Telegraph, it appears transport officials were working on a secret pay-per-mile scheme, codenamed Future RUC, strangely, as recently as January this year. The news will alarm anyone that needs to drive in London, which has just been named the slowest city to drive through in the entire world. Congestion charging has actually made congestion worse. Quite an achievement. Well done, everyone. Now, shocking new figures reveal that over 800,000 cases of shoplifting are reported every single year in England and Wales. In response to this, the government has announced it intends to introduce a new law specifically for attacking retail workers. Those caught under new legislation will face a maximum of six months' imprisonment, but with jails already full and most people not serving their full sentences, many are asking whether these new laws will go far enough. We've often heard, have we not, um, that the government keeps introducing new laws they don't need to introduce, just enforce the old ones. Let's talk uh, to former police superintendent Leroy Logan. Leroy, very good evening to you. Welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, is that the case? We've already got laws in place. What are these new laws going to do that the old laws don't? That's a very good question, Mike. Um, in all honesty, there's sufficient legislation to cover all these things, and I, I just don't know what they're trying to do um, is it just to show that they're doing something to make people feel better about these things? I, I really don't know. Um, but what I think needs to be done is that police need to be very proactive and catching these culprits, hopefully before they've done harm to the shop um, owners, uh, the, the shoppers themselves, the members of the public, and to ensure that they get the appropriate sentence in court. The, the last thing you want is for them to get caught and then there's nothing to show it. Um, uh, getting a slap on the wrist and the court say, well, you know, um, go off on the other way. 
there needs to be more stringent uh, and, and more severe sentences to send a very strong signal. And uh, hopefully that in itself will do what's required. More legislation, I think, just makes it more confusing for right. officers. They, they just need to get on with the job that they're supposed to do in the here and now. Right. Well, because when I watch the various videos that you can now see on a daily basis of people going into shops with bags and literally just filling them and walking out of the shop, you know, they're not going to be stopped by some guy saying, you know, there's a law against that now. Uh, they're going to be arrested and you could face some time in jail. They're not going to care, are they? Exactly. Um, if, if, if this, there's been sufficient laws, sufficient police powers to deal with this. Um, so it means that it's more than just policing out. You can't arrest your way at the problem. So it's a question of getting more support to those people vulnerable to this sort of um, crime. So if they're getting into drugs and alcohol, if they're getting into um, negative peer groups that might involve um, cr getting involved in these gangs, because a lot of these people who are involved in this large uh, amount of shop thefts, some of it is initiations into gangs. Right. Go and rob that store, you get points to be part of our gang or our negative peer group. So we, you need to get those diversion schemes away from the getting sucked into the cycle of crime and violence. Um, a lot of that is through exclusions. Um, a lot of our young people involved in, uh, who've been excluded from school are into alternative provisions that end up that their um, their colleges are prime in a lot of ways because the young people are left yeah. their own devices. So we have to keep these young people engaged if they're vulnerable to this sort of narrative, especially social media. That is a very uh, big accelerant to mm. exacerbating uh, this type of crime and glorifying it. And that's the thing. There's too much on social media and the media glorifying this stuff. And, and we. And as we really need to get the early intervention and prevention um, strategies so that people who are, you know, getting support don't get stuck into this type of um, lifestyle. Mm. OK. Leroy, thanks very much indeed. Leroy Logan there, a former Metropolitan Police officer, of course. Let's turn now to my panel for this evening. Editor of Spikes Online, Tom Slater, Telegraph journalist Madeline Grant and comedian Dave Chawner. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us. I mean, we seem to be so far down the road of lawlessness now in, in certain areas of, of our society that I'm not sure that anything is stopped. And when you hear Leroy Logan saying a lot of this stuff is now done as a kind of initiation, that makes a lot of sense to me because it does seem as though some of them are doing it almost for a dare. Mm -hmm. And I think the big part of the problem is the fact that people feel that they can get away with this yeah. stuff because it's often the fact that if you talk about like shoplifting or people going and clearing out the shelves right. in the local supermarket, it's a small number of people hitting yeah. a lot of places. The problem is when it feels like it's going to be kind of accepted, the police aren't yeah. really going to show up, it's just something that gets claimed on right. insurance if at all, then you're going to have those people just running riot. Mm. I don't think more laws is the answer to it. No. To enforce the law. Well, like you say, they're them. hardly going to be stopped by somebody at the door saying, there's a law against this, you know. <laughs> no, no. I say, you know, this that's, is illegal. That's what I don't understand. So there's not a law against shoplifting already? Well, there is. That's the point. But this so what's government... This, what's the point in there? Well, it's a very good question. Maybe Madeline can answer it. I mean, the government continually inter in, uh, intervene in these kind of situations now and say, don't worry, here's a new law. But everybody always then says, but there's already a law. It's already illegal. I, th I think their plan was to make assaulting a shop worker like a more serious crime yeah. than, than it would otherwise be. Mm. Um, and it's I, I read recently, and I couldn't believe this, that basically unless you, you shoplift um, £200 worth of mm. items, then you're not eligible for a prosecution. Right. So basically that so basically incentivizes that. people to just... Because if you're doing... Should we say kind of slightly smaller scale things, but but regularly you're dodging prosecution mm. every time. I would right. imagine. Well, I would I think mean, so. What kind of message is that sending? An awful yeah. lot of the shoplifting that you see, as I say, on social media, tends to be people just going into a place with a bag, and nobody's stopping them. They're not assaulting anybody. They're yeah. maybe being filmed, but nobody's trying to stop them because it's not worth trying to do because you don't know if you get stabbed yeah. or attacked or whatever. And frankly, it's it's a bit it's a bit American actually. It's that kind of U.S. style looting of just yeah. taking mm. a big bag and like clearing right. a. Clearing a shelf completely. Yeah, it's it's astonishing that we let this happen. I mean, we're looking at some We've, of it now. Um, yeah, and basically, there's nobody stopping these people because I've only ever seen a couple of instances where where perhaps corner shops have taken a baseball bat to them, and that's yeah. about anything that's going to stop them. If they think they're going to get hurt, but if they think they're going to get arrested, they're not going to worry. I've noticed more shops are now having their own hiring their own private security mm. to handle this because there is, as Tom said, you know that feeling of lawlessness. But actually, there are rules that mean that I think private security guards 
can't request to look inside someone's bag, which right. also seems nonsense to me. Right. Um, only the police can do that. So it probably is still quite possible to evade capture, yeah. even if you have a private security guard there. Right. I mean, I saw a, a, a very surprising thing in my local sort of shopping centre. There's a Tesco's there, and there was a guy being wrestled to the ground by two Tesco security guys, because he clearly decided he was going to run off with a bag full of stuff. And I was it WrestleMania? They, uh, it looked a bit like that. Really? People were sort of filming it, because, you know, it's one of those things now. People, all they do is take out their cameras and film it. Mm. And they were giving this guy quite a good doing, actually. Um, and he managed to get up and sort of run off, but they kept all the stuff back. But you don't see that very often. No. You don't see anybody being tackled, really. I mean, this facial recognition idea as well. I don't know what that's mm. going to do. I mean, if you tell people that they might be recognised, they'll just wear a balaclava, won't they? It just seems to be coming up with very complicated, probably bad solutions yeah. to quite simple problems, yeah. one of which is you've got the laws, you should enforce it. The other thing is, like you were saying, Madeline, about making it basically decriminalising kind of low-level yes. theft. America shows us where that leads. You go to mm. a New York or San Francisco yeah. at the moment, you want to buy some toothpaste, they've got to get it out from some kind right. of screen behind a lock of yeah. lock yeah. key because they're worried about people coming in cleaning right. out the shelves because right. they know how much they can get away with stealing. So I think, again, people look for these, you know, whiz-bang ideas, new laws or whatever. Yeah. Mm. Enforce the laws that are already there and get the security you need. Surely that's... But is it too far out. gone for that? I mean, are there too many of these crimes being committed? Like, the police can't... I mean, certainly can't in Scotland because they're busy, you know, <laughs> arresting people for hate crime or non-hate crime. But, you know, there, there literally aren't enough police, are there? Never will be. Well, I mean, I think we, you can't say that no problem can be solved, you know, like, it's hopeless. Oh, well, I can say that. It's, we're doomed. <laughs> I think, I don't, well, I don't no, know if like, this one can That be. makes it seem like governments don't have the power to do something differently. They, they do. Um, mm. And if, if, if pe the public kind of checks out and thinks, basically retreats from, like, business life and civic life and says, well, no, there's no point, yeah. then, you know, you can't really, gi I don't think you should just, like, give up on... No, the, I, I mean, I'm not giving up, but I'm asking yeah. the question. I mean, Leroy would say and would tell you that what, what he thinks we should do is dissuade the people from doing the shoplifting rather than arresting them and trying to put them in a prison where there isn't any space. And I think that's maybe where they have to start looking and stop the, these kids being, you know, recruited into gangs. But again, you know, that's a massive problem because they're all selling drugs and they're all making a lot of money. There's also a bit of a bystander problem, I think, where, you know, something happens and people just pull out their phones. Now, I'm not expecting people kind of lay their lives on the line to protect Tesco's bottom line or whatever. Right. But there was a kind of thing where if you saw something going wrong, particularly if it was a smaller business, yeah. you might right. trip that person up yeah. if they were running away. Or yeah, whatever. absolutely. That sort of thing doesn't happen now either. Which no. I got told off for so. doing that. There was a guy at Nixon Pantem Pro V, uh, and he went. He got on his. Did he have nice hair. He had really nice hair. <laughs> yeah. I, was like, I, thought, I thought it was a waste. To Very be important. Um, you know. And he he got he went and got his bike, and then he came back in and got some more stuff. And I, I stood in the way to like try and stop yeah. him. And the security. Well, I just thought it was a Sunday. Not what I expect of you, Dave. I've got nothing else on. You know right. what I mean? Like I thought this would be a laugh. Right. And um, the security guard just stood there and watched it. Right. And I felt, I felt let down. And so he just took more stuff, or, or did, did your intervention stop him? From oh, it did nothing. I mean, like, I don't think, I don't think I'm built to be a security guard. I think no. that's what it taught me. <laughs> right. But it, it is that bystander effect of, oh, in that moment, I was like, what do I do? Like, because if I've got him, right. what's the next step? Right. Yeah. Like, what I'm, ju I'm just well, holding on to a man who's got some bad temper. There used to be a time when you'd be sort of shamed into not stealing because you'd be frightened of what yeah. people would say. But do you think, think? Do you think shame is the answer? It could be. Yes. I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, almost all circumstances. Even, even thugs don't like to be shamed, I think. You know, maybe that is the answer. Well, there is this weird way where it's kind of not as socially unacceptable as it yeah. used to be, which yeah. is quite interesting. Right. You even get people kind of making excuses for it. It's the cost of living crisis. Yeah, yeah. Of course they're going to clear out the shame. Yeah. And then yeah. we get the wokest. Yeah, I don't like quite, that. Yeah, we've got to go, but, I'm, but we'll, we'll talk about this some more. But the wokest will say as well, of course, you know, it's the capitalists that are charging too much money for everything, so we should just steal from them. That's what we'll get. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Stay with me. Uh, because up next, the Bulgarian gang uh, didn't actually shoplift, but they pleaded guilty to falsely pocketing more than £50 million pounds of universal credit, and the EU finally pulls its finger out to deal with migration. But are they all talk and no trousers? Back in a few. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite right Yay. too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now it's time for Taking the Mic. Now, there can't be too many things easier than to travel to this country, whether legally or illegally, and manage to settle here, bring your entire family and change your life forever. It seems whether you've arrived on a dinghy, in the back of a lorry, on a student visa, or you just bought a ticket for the Eurostar, it won't be long before you've learned the ways of your new country and soon enough you'll be living high on the hog. But I think I may have found something even easier, and that is to defraud the benefits business. An incredible story came to light today about five Bulgarian nationals who managed to form a gang and who claimed universal credit over five years, creating benefits factories for scores of different identities. They managed to get more than £50 million out of the state before anyone noticed. Perhaps the most surprising thing about this remarkable tale is that they actually got caught at all. Yesterday, Galina Nikolova, Stoyan Stoyanov, Svetka Todorova, Gyunish Ali and Patrizia Paneva pleaded guilty to fraud and money laundering at Wood Green Crown Court in London. Between October 2016 and May 2021, the group made thousands of false claims to universal credit using either real people or hijacked identities. And their claims were supported by an array of forged documents, including fictitious tenancy agreements, counterfeit pay slips, forged letters from landlords, doctors and lawyers. In the unlikely event their claims were rejected, the gang simply resubmitted them until they were accepted. They set up three benefit factories from where they promised people they could obtain national insurance numbers for them, which would allow them to claim benefits. They then made the claims themselves and laundered the money into cash. When they were arrested, the authorities found sacks of money, expensive designer goods, including watches, sunglasses and clothes, and they even found a car full of cash as well. The case is being called the biggest ever benefit fraud prosecution brought before the courts, but it's a mere drop in the ocean compared to the amounts that go missing every single year. Last month, it was revealed that universal credit fraud has cost the taxpayer £11 billion in fraud in the past two years alone. Covid didn't help, of course, but the levels of fraud are still way higher than they were in 2019. There can be no doubt that the benefits system in this country, like much of the rest of it, is not fit for purpose. 
There are almost 6 million people benefiting from it who are now categorised as economically inactive. And seeing a case like this, where five people were able to remove more than £50 million from the system, I can't help but wonder how many more millions are being paid to fraudsters and malingerers. Is it any wonder this country is stony broke? Now, in a slightly related subject, after years and years of negotiations, the European Parliament has finally approved a major reform tightening the EU's rules on migration and asylum. The EU Asylum and Migration Pact will apparently speed up the asylum process and boost the return of irregular migrants to home countries and require EU member states to share responsibility for asylum seekers. But is it that simple? Let's speak now to immigration lawyer Harjup Singh Bangal and prospective Reform UK parliamentary candidate, former MEP himself, Mr Rupert Lowe, a very good evening uh, to both of you. Um, let me start um, with you, Harjap. I mean, I've read what this um, sort of pact is supposed to ask countries to do, but it all seems a bit vague. You know, we've got people from Belgium saying, well, we've signed up to it, but we're not really sure it's right. We've got Hungarians saying we don't want any refugees at all. Poland saying we're not really going to buy into this. We've already got figures that suggest that we don't deport anyone anymore, um, even once they've been refused asylum. So exactly how is this going to change anything, if, if it is? Well, it's a bit of a mix at the moment. And it's, you're right, there is a sort of a um, uh, disagreement between the states themselves. However, the broad consensus is that, OK, 380,000 people crossed, illegally crossed um, into the EU uh, last year, and something has to be done about it. And elections are coming up. And as we know, election is a time of promises. It's a time when people fear for the change of uh, loss of their seats and a change of government. And therefore, to hold on to power, people have to really try and deliver or promise at least to deliver uh, what the public wants. And if this is what the public wants to stop illegal migration, then this is what they're going to have to agree on. I mean, what the details are a bit sketchy. They're saying, well, hold on, we're going to process all the claims within 12 weeks. And if they're rejected within another 12 weeks, we're going to send people back. How exactly they're going to do this, in what numbers they're going to do this, what mechanism they have is all something that's going to be in the detail. But right. the general consensus is it has been passed. Yes, it has. And it doesn't really explain where all of these people will in fact be processed. Rupert, you've been in the European Parliament, so you know how it works. I mean, what do you make of this particular sort of what I would regard as a bit of a botched job, really? Well, I couldn't agree with you more, Mike. I mean, when I was in the European Parliament, they were constantly banging on about this. It's not new. Uh, as Harjab says, I mean, this is a response to the fact that the right wing parties in Europe are beginning to gain substantial ground. And I think the sort of post-war elite who, as you know, have, have basically embraced open borders, multiculturalism and everything that's uh, that's showing signs of failing badly. Uh, as you quite rightly say, Hungary is not going to play. He's not going to play ball with this. Uh, I suspect several other members of the 27 won't either. Uh, and they haven't got the structure, in my opinion, to deal with uh, any form of tightening of the security of their borders. So I, I mean, words are easy, but I always say, as you know, watch what the hands are doing, not what the mouth is yeah. saying. And um, as usual in Europe, the mouth says a lot, but the hands <laughs> do very little. Well, quite. And Harjab, I mean, one of the, I suppose, warning sort of signs for this particular act is that it talks about, you know, um, countries taking responsibility for asylum seekers, meaning presumably that the EU will attempt to distribute people across various different countries. Now, presuming that we're not now part of the EU, Britain wouldn't necessarily sign up to that, or it might do, but they're saying they're trying to protect the frontline countries like Spain, Greece and Italy, who do bear the brunt of, of, sort of a lot of this migration initially from, from the North African coast. Um, what do you see in, inside of this distribution sort of scenario that it would mean for Britain? I think for Britain, Britain's at the moment is fairly safe because we're not part of the EU anymore, we're not part of its pact anymore. However, like we said, I mean, like Rupert said, will countries like Romania, Hungary, Poland, essentially the Ascension countries, as, as we call them, accept it because it's notorious there, you know, that um, asylum seekers aren't that welcome. Uh, there are riots and clashes yeah. between, uh, you know, the, the population, the residents there and asylum seekers. 
And therefore, is this distribution going to work? Well, the alternative is given in the pact that if you don't want to take on any migrants, then you're going to have to cough up a bit more and help the countries economically that do, almost like a fine in effect, right. saying, well, hold, you can, if you don't want any, then this is the X amount you can do. You can waive off um, your amount that you're supposed to um, take on. However, if these countries, or will these countries, will, it be, or will they be able to pay? What effects will it have on their economy? I think for Britain, it's, it can only be a good thing for Britain if Europe are trying to stop illegal migrants coming into Europe and hence the trickle down into Britain it, for, from a point of view of not letting people in a small, small boat crossings. However, Britain's problem is removal. Like you yeah. said, the removal of migrants, that has not been happening. Under this government, the removal spiral chart is downward spiral. It's, um, you know, we've gone from 11,000, 10,000 enforced removals. Um, enforced removals are those when we uh, force people to go back after their claims have been rejected um, from 2010 to almost uh, two years ago, less than 2,000. Mm. So removals is a huge, huge problem. For, for the UK. And until we get a grip on that, um, we're not going to see a lot of figures go down. Our problem is a lot of people who do get rejected and then just go um, underground and mm. stay in the system or well, are allowed to apply again. Well, that is, is, is exactly the problem. And Rupert, let me, let me come on to you with that because we've got a new report out today which says that two-thirds of applicants who were refused asylum in this country were not recorded as having left the UK in the decade from 2011. So basically, over the last sort of 13 years, even if you are refused asylum, even if you refuse it more than once, you don't end up leaving the country. Because if you do, if you do finally get granted asylum, you stay. And if you don't, you just disappear into the sort of the dark corners of wherever. Well, Mike, we, we, we've been over this before on a number of occasions we certainly have. together. And we just, the country hasn't got the will to deal with this. Uh, we've got a woke judiciary that basically defeats the government at every at every possible juncture they can. They're completely out of touch with the, the will of the British people. And as we know, in my constituency in the West Midlands, when I was an MEP, there were hotels being taken over, the structure of society was being damaged. Uh, the cost to the taxpayer is massive. I think there was a report today saying it's cost $4.3 billion in 2023 to deal with this illegal immigration issue. Well, we then hear Rachel Reeves banging on about how she's going to fleece productive Britain and the tax evaders, as you quite rightly said earlier, mm. they do nothing to the people who are porking the system for benefits and everything else. It's productive England and Britain that they want to attack. And they send HMRC into action to resile on EIS approvals they've given to damage uh, AIM VCT funds and do all the things that they do to basically destroy enterprise in the country. So, you know, it's no coincidence 4.3 billion plays the 5 billion that Rachel Reeves has been claiming Middle England isn't paying in tax. So, look, I mean, Middle England's very patient, Mike, but I think when you see the Reform Party going up in the polls, which is almost unheard of in the way that, that, that it is, you know, the government the elite, the establishment, they didn't deliver Brexit, despite the fact that people were given a vote on it. They're not delivering a control of our borders, even though we've left the, the, the EC. And, you know, that was the right decision for the country, in my opinion. The problem is we haven't got the apparatus after 44 years in the European Union. Our establishment has become flabby, it's become wet, and it's just not fit for purpose. And I think everybody can now see that. So. I, I watch with horror as a, a sovereign nation with effectively a sea surrounding it finds it impossible to, to manage its own borders. And yeah, indeed, we watch is. the French fle fleece us for half a billion and do nothing. Yeah, absolutely ridiculous. Rupert, thanks very much indeed. Uh, Rupert Lowe there, uh, prospective parliamentary candidate. Harjap Singh Bangal, we're out of time, I'm afraid, but thanks very much to both of you. Um, it's a problem that isn't going away. It's a problem that's not going to be solved uh, overnight or indeed by the EU, by the looks of it. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Do not change the channel. The Energy Secretary is calling out the ECHR now for telling governments what to do about climate change. But m and have another solution up their sleeves. Don't move. I'll be back with the story after the break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker.
Now, you ain't talk. going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for yeah. minute, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed to have was moved another on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. The World of Work. Now, it was just the other day that we heard of the wacky ideas to have people drink camel milk instead of cow's milk to make the planet a safer place for us all. Apparently, the introduction of oat milk, which isn't milk, and almond milk, which also isn't milk, hasn't quite done the trick to ensure that cows are phased out from the entirety of milk production. Cows, you see, are a major problem when it comes to global warming, climate change, and making greenhouse gases, or whatever your planetary warming warning happens to be this week. Despite all the gassing about clean air, pollution from planes, cars, trains, and ships, it's actually nothing compared to the kind of poison produced by cows all over the world. The humble bovines, it appears, are responsible for nearly 40% of the entire world's methane emissions from agriculture, <coughs> according to the International Energy Agency. Sorry about that. Uh, it's literally coming out of their backsides in the form of farts. Methane, of course, is one of the most potent greenhouse gases and is now being blamed for warming the planet. So forget oil, gas and low emission zones. What we need now are some spotty teenagers gluing themselves to cattle and holding up slogans that say, just stop farting. As you might expect, Western industrial food producers have got a plan. Nestle are already experimenting with giving methane suppressants to the poor cows to stop them farting. They're adding seaweed, essential oils and probiotics to their feed in the hopes that it might stop them polluting the planet. And closer to home, Marks & Spencer is getting in on the act too. They are now spending over a million pounds to cut around 11,000 tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions in their latest bid to hit net zero targets. Who knew those Frisians could be so dangerous? And where's Greta Thunberg when you need her? m and aren't stopping with watering down the milk pool either. They're also planning to use AI to manage their heating, 
ventilation and air conditioning in six stores to cut down on energy consumption. And they're starting another trial that will involve asking customers to donate unwearable clothes to Oxfam. These clothes will be reused and turned into new material. They're looking to cut another 2,000 tonnes of carbon emissions and reduce their cost by 3 million quid, while managing to get some virtue signalling points at the same time. How utterly ridiculous. Get it? Maybe they should just donate all their clothes to Oxfam, shut down the shops and go home. On a bicycle, of course, because that is the world of woke. The world of woke. Full fat, of course. Now, a ruling by the European Court of Human Rights arguing that governments have a duty to protect people from climate change has been slammed by British ministers. The case was brought forward by around 2,500 women in Switzerland with an average age of 74, supported by none other than Greta Thunberg. Energy Secretary Claire Coutinho says she's concerned about the judgment and warned it should be for elected politicians to make decisions not judges. And it comes a week after Rishi Sunak warned Britain could quit the ECHR to get a grip on the small boats crisis, a move backed by half of Tory voters. So have the ECHR risked the danger of being kicked out of Britain? Joining me now is Will Hodson, an energy expert. Will, uh, very good evening to you. Thanks very much for joining us here on the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. It's interesting timing this, that uh, the ECHR, which other people have said, well, you know, it's not really a court at all. It's a human rights organisation mm. that saves people from being madly treated and, and mistreated and treated, you know, as if they're not humans. But this is a very odd ruling. Um, and even the mm. Swiss government, I think, have said so, haven't they? Well, the Swiss government would say so because the Swiss government's been taken to task here by, you're quite right, not spotty teenagers chucking paint on Van Gogh's. This is a group of women largely in their 70s who have said that they are at risk of heat waves because of climate change and that the Swiss government has not done what it said it was going to do under law. Now, I take my time as I set up that point, Mike, because what the court has not done is said, you've got to do something and right. they're going to make it up. What they've said is you as a government have committed to do things in law and we have found you're not doing them. And because of that, people's rights, in this case, a right to life, have been put in jeopardy. Yes, but that's why it's a bit absurd, isn't it? Because looking at what they're asking the Swiss government to do isn't really anything. And all they're saying is that you said you would stop this happening and you haven't. But they haven't said what's caused it, so they haven't said whether it's within the power of the Swiss government to actually stop it happening. And I would say any legal uh, sort of, you know, professor would tell you that and any legal professor would point that out and say, well, you know, there's clearly no point in law here. It's just a kind of slightly hysterical ruling which is meant to please people who have brought a case for human rights, because you might say, if you're a 74-year-old Swiss woman, that, you know, you're frightened of going outside because it's too hot. But you can't really blame the government for that. You can blame all sorts of people. Maybe blame the cows for, for all the methane they're pushing out. No, well, in this instance, it's correct that no country on their own can um, reverse climate change or even bring it under control. But what governments have done is they've entered into various agreements. In this country, we put the Climate Change Act into law in 2008. Um, they enter into those agreements, which are internationally linked, and that's the best hope to avoid the worst effects of climate change. And for these people who are in their 70s, I mean, the threat of a heat wave actually killing them is real. So, to some extent... Well, it's real, in their, it's real in their head, but it's not real, is it? Because nobody's going to tell you that over the next 10 years, but maybe 20 years, they lived to 94, that Switzerland's going to get so hot that they're going to die from heat exhaustion. Most people in this country and in the rest of Europe die from the cold, not from the heat. Well, that's a separate thing. And in terms well, it's of not, people though. Being by the health service in the winter, we should do something about that. But in terms of people dying from heat waves, Mike, that's a fact. You know, we've seen Britain hit temperatures of 40. In Switzerland, it gets hotter. They might be looking at heat waves into the high, into yeah, the yeah. mid-40s. Yeah, but my, point, but my point, though, Will, is that, you know, in law, there is no... there is no relief here. There is no way that you could make it a legal case. And that's why it's a bit of a joke, really. Well, I think such as, I mean, such as I can follow the legal arguments, and these are fairly august lawyers and courts we're talking about here, Mike, I think what they're saying is you have in place laws in Switzerland that they've entered into, the Swiss government, this is not foisted onto them by Swiss judges or European judges, there are laws that have been entered into which are doing their best to mitigate climate change, and yet, would you believe it, government down the line 
drop policy they've entered into because they can find something which is easier and easier to sell in the short term politically. Now, in that sense, this goes beyond just climate change and action on climate change. It's about making governments stick to what they said they were going to do, which is why potentially our own energy secretary, Claire Coutinho, is slightly nervous and spooked by it. Well, no, I don't think so. I think that's a totally wrong interpretation of it, because at the end of the day, in order to impose something on a government, in order to tell a government that you have to do something, you have to have an option for them to do it. And there is no option, because all they're saying is but you haven't done enough. So if they do anything no, no, more, no, it's not no, clear. No, hang on. No, it's not, no, it's not clear. That's a no, fundamental it's, difference. No, no, it's not fundamentally different. The point is, is they're, not, they're, they're saying you haven't done enough, but they haven't then specified what it is that enough will be. Therefore, it's nebulous. No, no, it's simply a question of them actually, let's say that you've got a plan to get to net zero by 2050. But it doesn't uh, matter if you do. That, you've entered into that by law. Just for a second, mate. you entered into that by law uh, and you do that to great fanfare. And let's not forget, in 2019, Boris Johnson rode to a landslide election victory with net zero on the front page of his manifesto. Yeah, but that's now, not if the next got, that's five elected, years, though. you find a Conservative government or any government who's got a similar ticket is in completely in, you know, flouting those commitments, which that's generally would outrage people who voted for them. No, that's not then true. Then they be held to task. No, I'm sorry, you must be living in a parallel universe, Will, because people voted Boris Johnson in to leave the European Union, one. Secondly, uh, the climate change uh, initi initiatives that were brought in, including to supposedly hit net zero, are still being operational because we are all paying a lot more tax as a result. Net zero is part of uh, the, the world in which we live, I'm afraid. And so if you think that the net zero promises are not being stuck to, you're not living in the real world because they absolutely are. We're paying green taxes on our energy that we bring into the house. We're paying green taxes on the fuel that we put into our cars. We're paying green taxes on the planes that we fly in. We're paying green taxes all over the place. There's all sorts of subsidies being given to green companies in order to hit net zero. So to say that they're not actually following what they said they would do is incorrect. Well, hang on. They're draining for new oil and gas in Rosebank. They're leaving Britain still hugely dependent on gas in our fuel mix. That's why Britain almost yeah, because, won any because other the grid has to be. Or our bills spike because we were so reliant on gas. We're not insulating homes. They've dropped obligations uh, on, on, on landlords to insulate the worst quality housing in Britain. Um, so all of those things are reverses, as are policies they've had on heat pumps, policies they've had on electric vehicles. Now, how you feel about those policies is one thing, Mike. If you drop them and say, no, we're still completely on target... No, to people have stopped buying electric vehicles because they've stopped being subsidised. The only people buying electric vehicles now are companies because you can't charge them enough, you can't, you, there's no infrastructure, uh, and they're too expensive. And also, uh, they are now being uh, uh, turned down for loans by financial companies in this country because, quite simply, it's all a disaster. But listen, we've obviously got a lot more to talk about, so you'll have to come in uh, and, and sit here and properly argue with me uh, for a much longer period of time because, unfortunately, we're out of time. But thank you very much... Uh, indeed. Will Hodson. We'll talk to you again very soon. Um, let's go across the Atlantic now, though, because uh, David Cameron was up in Washington's Capitol Hill meeting up with top members of Congress, having been snubbed by the Speaker of the US House of Representatives because he asked to discuss sending aid to Ukraine on his trip there. Here's what the Foreign Secretary had to say. The latest assessment leaves our position on export licences unchanged. This is consistent with the advice that I and other ministers have received, and as ever, we will keep the position under review. Let me be clear though, we continue have to have grave concerns around the humanitarian access issue in Gaza, both for the period that was assessed and subsequently. Bit of a snub for poor old Lord Cameron when he went there to see the Speaker, but he did see Donald Trump. Let's cross now to New Jersey and bring in Fox News contributor, Mr Joe Concha. Joe, very good to see you. Welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, he didn't get to see the main man, but he did see the main man, if you know what I mean. Uh, he saw the next president of the United States of America, didn't he? <laughs> the main man now being <laughs> Joe Biden, of course, did meet with him. Uh, then Speaker Johnson, who may not be Speaker Johnson for too much longer, uh, blew him off. But then eventually, yes, uh, while he was in Florida, did meet with Donald Trump. And it, it's, it's interesting because if, if you follow Lord Cameron in terms of his rhetoric and positions around Israel and around Gaza and this whole conflict, this horrible conflict that began at the hands of Hamas on October 7th, it appears that instead of backing Israel's very battle for survival, Lord Cameron has, at least since the turn of the year, has been more vocal in backing the Palestinians mm. instead of the Israelis. And he even appears to be indicating that Britain might be prepared to recognize Palestinian statehood before this war is even over. So 
Uh, he has made the same kind of turn that Joe Biden has in terms of being staunchly uh, pro-Israel to now on the fence. And on mm. the fence is never a good thing uh, when you have uh, a war like this going on where every day uh, seems to be moving further away from ceasefire or any sort of resolution right. or any sort of ending, quite frankly. Right. And the only ending that's acceptable is all hostages out and Hamas completely and totally dismantled and defeated. Exactly right. And this is why conservatives in this country hold their head in their hands, Joe, because, you know, isn't it surprising that the former prime minister of this country, now the foreign secretary, goes to Washington and has more in common with Joe Biden um, than he does with anybody else? <laughs> Yes, and, and that's troubling because in Joe Biden's case, uh, he needs to win the state of Michigan uh, to win re-election. Yeah. And that has a very large Muslim Arab population there. 100,000 votes were cast for uncommitted instead of Biden during a primary, basically was running against no one. So the left here is putting extreme pressure on Biden to go hard after Netanyahu, Netanyahu uh, and to push for a ceasefire without. And again, this is the whole key, the whole ballgame, mm. the return of all hostages. If that's not included in any negotiation, then it's not a negotiation right. because you're leaving Hamas with their biggest bargaining chip. Right. And we saw Hamas turn down the ceasefire agreement uh, just the other day. So, you know, every time there is a sit down um, organised, whether it's in Egypt or Qatar or wherever it is, um, it never really comes to anything because it seems to me that the, um, the Hamas uh, organisers know that if they do give up the hostages, they have given up their final bargaining chip and they probably will be destroyed. Precisely. And Hamas at this point, they obviously, they, they, this whole attack on October 7th never was done with any sort of intention that, well, eventually uh, this could lead to a and my lights just went out, which oh, is very odd. So I'm I sorry about that. that. We lost power here in New Jersey. Um, Goodness and me. I'm on a generator right now. So, hey. <laughs> you need to put some TV, money baby. in the... You need to put some, goes. put some money in the meter, Joe. Um, while we've got you on, just one final mention uh, of a very strange interview uh, that was taken uh, this, this, uh, this day, I think, on CNBC. Michael Avenatti um, is a, a, a lawyer who was involved in the Trump case, the hush money case. Tell me about what he said to MSNBC. Oh, I'll, I'll be happy to share that. But oh, again, this was a convicted felon last night. Yeah, I think there's definitely power cut going on in that part of North America. Uh, I was there again. They had an earthquake just after I left, for heaven's sake. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, we'll come back to that subject matter, I'm sure. We'll maybe have a look at it tomorrow night. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Stay watching, though, because I've got some more coming up. I'll tell you why the butchers, grocers and news agents have vanished from our streets and why a honey trap scandal could never work on French spies. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. I'd like to welcome back my panel. Now, apparently, you, Les, is making ingestion in London worse. That's according to new figures from TomTom, Tom, who basically have worked out uh, that it now takes more time to drive across London than it, drives, than it takes across any city in the entire world. We are now officially the slowest city uh, in, I was going to say Christendom, but it's actually worse than that. Um, <laughs> it's another word you don't use very much. But yeah, I mean, it's just incredible, isn't it? That all the congestion charging, all the bus lanes, all the cycle lanes, everything that's been put into London to supposedly make the air cleaner has made everything slower. It's ridiculous. Uh, it makes no sense, because if you've got all those cars running their engines... Yeah. It's completely static. Yeah. Time, and it's not good for the air quality. Can't that's be, what you're can worried it? about. But it's also people... F you know, Sadiq Khan, or any other politician who might be in office at the moment, um, is... They got into this idea that kind of cities don't need cars. Mm. Like, because of the fact that um, people who are graphic designers, who people who they might hang out with, can get about on bicycles. Yes. Um, tube and so on. Those god awful cargo bikes. That it's bikes. not necessary. It's ridiculous. Like, supplying the shops in central right. London. People who need to drive for a living because right. they drive a white van and they decorate yeah. houses, whatever. People who just need to take their kids yeah. to school. It's really important. Or there might be the odd train strike, the which means you can't get in any other way. Absolutely. Which is happening more and more. Yeah. It is inc incredible, isn't it? I mean, I, I used to, you know, we used to film this show over in Ealing. Um, and to drive from here to Ealing and back every day, it worked, I worked out that I was spending something like 12 hours a week in a car. Oh because it was sometimes more than an hour just to get across sort of, you know, something ridiculous like 10 miles. Here's a really bad one, though. Round by me, they had a ULEZ congestion charge and they've taken it away, but they haven't taken any of the signs down. Oh, really? Isn't that cheeky? Yeah, that so you've cheeky. still got them all up and only the locals know that you can go straight through and stuff. Really? Because they, they, they sent us a letter saying, oh, we've taken it down, but none of the signs have gone down. <gasps> I've got loads of big planters in the middle of the roads, which is really weird because yeah. they're getting painted twice a week, which seems... Odds. Like, that that's a lot odd. of painting. Listen, I've got a much more interesting story for Go you, on. though. Uh, honey traps do not work on French spies, according to the Peace and Telegraph, <laughs> uh, because their wives are all expecting them to be having affairs anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is brilliant. What a wonderful civilization. It reminds yeah. me of, like, a few years ago, there was a group of French intellectuals who did an open letter denouncing Dry January. Yeah. And denouncing all the other prohibitions that have been imposed right. on them by the kind of Anglo-Saxon yeah, yeah, yeah. world. You know, you can't take a mistress, you can't yeah. drink in January. What's yeah. going on? I feel like it's another extension of that. What Apparently, the, the Russians have given up trying people. to turn them. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they don't, they've run out of ideas, basically. It's a bit like the Italians. I remember talking of, um, of sort of road congestion and stuff. The, the Italians tried to put in a, um, a camera system into, into the streets of Rome. And apparently everyone was up in arms, including most of the politicians, because they kept all getting caught driving into the city with the mistress in the car, as opposed to the wife. <laughs> and all of these pictures were being relayed all over the place. And so they actually had the cameras all lifted. And they went, no, we can't have this because we're all sitting in cars with the wrong women. Well, there was like one of the great sex scandals of history was when Francois Hollande, who was, I guess, pre president of France about 10 years ago, yes. something like this. Um, he was caught going out, in, you know, a bloke in his probably late 50s. He was off on a Vespa in the middle of the night. I remember to that. His French mm -hmm. mistress, who was like a famous actress, that. 25 years yeah. younger than him. It's just like peak France. <laughs> and weren't they all, I mean, Mitterrand was up to no good in that. Oh, in yeah. Respect, he had well, a whole, he? he had a whole secret family. Yeah. Who I think lived, they were given like a grace and favour house, his right. second secret family. Unbelievable. Absolutely. I mean, we definitely, it's not as if we don't have sex scandals in Britain, but they tend to be a bit more, um, sort of seedy rather than glamorous. They are. Mm. And often there's, a, there's an element of like 
right. mass incompetence to it, as, as yes. with Will Rag. As with People Will being a moron, really, that right. it all comes Absolutely. out. But we've got yeah. James Bond, do you know what I mean? You'd think it's the other way around. Like, if yeah. James Bond was real, then yeah. it would just be some, like... Although James Bond in the last film was very monogamous and had a baby, so I'm yeah. a bit that's like, that's point. gone yeah. too. He's gone a bit woke as James Bond, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, let's have a look at m and latest... We were talking about m and and their um, anti-cow manoeuvres. Um, they've now um, managed to put out an advert for some furniture. I think we can see the ad here. Um, but unfortunately, whoever decided to take the picture didn't check that the props were right because the bottle of wine that sits on the table um, is actually not from m it's from Aldi. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's a sort of peak idiot, isn't it? You know, it's amazing when people don't check these things. You yeah. just think, well, you've only got one bottle of wine there, would you not just check that it's an m &S bottle of wine? And also, okay. as far as I understand it, don't they have a kind of long-running yeah. beef with Aldi? Yes. Because yeah. of the fact that Aldi will take their... Colin it's the Caterpillar, Caterpillar Colin, Caterpillar, Colin, Colin Caterpillar. have their own version it? of it. They'll do it for various different brands and things. So for, to really, mm. yeah. you know, give that boost to your bitter rival. In that yeah. The War of the Roses. More, like that. Very good. <laughs> hey, hey, very see, nice. this is why we play with the big... I'm, actually, I'm not going to lie, I was really the pleased first joke I don't care who's talking, I'll tell that. the first joke you've ever made. <laughs> I'll see Especially a, a comedian. Oh, I'll see you later. <laughs> um, so extraordinary good. stuff. Death of the High Street, we haven't got time. Um, Flesh-eating zombie drug as well coming. Uh, in case you need any... Uh, oh, that's nice. Yeah. Mm. Apparently, if you take this drug, um, the only problem is your arms fall off. Um, other so, than that, it's great. Other yeah. than that, yeah. <laughs> but other than that, <laughs> great. It feels What's the great. benefit of the drug? Um, um, well, do you need to ask? Oh, well, like, if it was something like you've got a problem with your so arms... So you'd be anyway. OK as long as there's another benefit if your yeah, arms yeah, fell yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, fine, OK. If Don't the give me any drugs. No. I'm, I'm open to it. Well, you can, we, can, we can find out later. But anyway, listen, thanks to all of you. That was a very short show. That's all from me. You've been watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. We'll be back tomorrow at 8pm uh, with a show that lasts a slightly longer, two hours, in fact. It's only on Talk TV. Good night. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Never mind the ballot. A brand new look at all things politics from The Sun with me, Harry Cole. Watch my big end of the week with no stone unturned. Every Thursday evening, exclusively with The Sun. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> this <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. 